Hello guys and welcome to my channel. My name is Milos and I'm a creator of original maps which I regularly post on Instagram and Twitter. I am back with another tutorial and this time we're going to talk about making maps based on Eurostat data. For those of you who don't know, Eurostat is a European Union agency that collects national and subnational information on different social demographic and economic issues in Europe. Uh, as you may know or you may not know, in my work I create a lot of uh, maps based on Eurostat data and uh, so far I created maps on uh, education, uh, population median age, uh, on the number of scientists and engineers, on uh, poverty, uh, material uh, deprivation, etc, etc. In this tutorial we will create a GDP per capita regional map of Europe using the last available Eurostat data, but following this tutorial you can create any other map based on the available data sets. So we will first go to the Eurostat database website where I will show you its interface uh, it's uh, tables, how you can uh, fetch these tables, how they look like. Uh, then we will move back to R and I will show you how to use the Eurostat package to uh, load the desired table directly into R. Then we will a bit play with data wrangling and put this table into proper formats and account for the missing values. And finally, we will create the GDP per capita map of Europe. Without further ado, let's roll! And we are back on the Eurostat database website where you can find a lot of interesting uh, tables covering different topics. You can access this website following the link in the upper left corner of the screen. Scrolling down, we find a tree of uh, different folders for us. The most uh, important one is the general regional statistics because we want to make a regional map of Europe. Uh, we expand this one uh, and then uh, we go for the second folder, which is Regional Statistics by NATS. It's not what you think. NATS stands simply for the Territorial Statistical Units. There are four types of NATS uh, on different uh, levels. NATS uh, null level is basically the national level. And then uh, NATS 1 to NATS 3, these are simply uh, different regional levels. NATS 1 being uh, the biggest and NATS 3 being the smallest. Uh, in this tutorial, we'll be using data on the NUTS2 level, which is the statistical unit of approximately 800,000 to 3 million people. Uh, but the data is also organized on different levels. Um, so regional statistics by NUTS classification, we expand this one, and then we get uh, different themes. Uh, so what we need is the GDP per capita, which is located in the regional economic accounts, we expand that one, and then we go for the first folder, which is the cross domestic product indicators. So over here, there are different ways of measuring GDP. Um, there's also uh, data on different levels, as I said, one is the NUTS2, uh, the other one is NUTS3. For us, the most important link is the first one, so it's the gross domestic product at current market prices by NUTS2 regions. Uh, and uh, we click now on uh, this uh, uh, table icon, which will then open the new window. The new window opens up interface where you can find the key information about the table that you want to download. So apart from the title, you can also find the online data codes, which we will use in R to tell the Eurostat package to download the table for us. Then going down Below, you can also select uh, certain uh, columns and even certain uh, values from this table. You can also format it in a proper way and ultimately you can also manually download the files. But uh, in this tutorial, we will tell R to do that for us without the need to manually uh, reformat the table. Now, in terms of the table itself, uh, you can scroll down and you will see that uh, there are several columns here. So the one is the geo, which denotes the NUTS uh, level. And then there are, these columns are actually years available. For our purpose, we want to get information on the last available year. So that would be 2021. But if we scroll down this table, uh, we actually might notice that some, for example, entities, for example, here like Norway or Switzerland, 
or uh, North Macedonia, Albania, they don't really have information for 2021. So in this case, what we will do is we will tell R to uh, use the last available uh, data from either 2021 or 2020. Uh, before we jump into R itself, I also want to show you a bit uh, the way we are going to call this table in R. So we do need to get the codes uh, of, of this uh, table values. Uh, and then uh, when we go to the selection, uh, there are several values here that are important for us in order to load this table in R. So one of them is, of course, Geo. The other one is time. Time denotes year. We will be using, as I said, 2020 uh, 20 and 2021. Uh, because most, if not all, of the Eurostat data is on the annual level, we don't really need this filter to call the table, but we do need a unit uh, filter. And if we open up here, there are a lot of options on how you can uh, present uh, GDP data. For us, the most important one is the euro per inhabitant so there are multiple options here so you can either take this one euro per inhabitant where the indicator is called um, eur uh, underscore hab but uh, because we also would like to show uh, a gdp per capita standardized by the purchasing power we would opt for the purchasing power standard per inhabitant so we also select uh, this one and we are back in R, where we will load uh, several packages necessary to carry out this tutorial. Uh, one of them is Tidyverse, which we use for uh, data wrangling and mapping. Then the SF package, which helps us handle the shapefile of Europe and the NUTS2 shapefile. Then the third one is the class in package, which will help us create a legend breaks uh, Gisco R is a very convenient package that uh, we can use to directly call the NUTS2 and the country shapefiles. And finally, last but not least, is the Eurostat package. We will use Eurostat package to get that table and provide information about the variables we specifically need. We'll start off by loading the shapefiles, uh, in specific the NUTS2 and the country borders shapefile. And before we do that, we first define uh, a base uh, georeference uh, coordinate system that we will use. And this one will be just a standard WGS84. Now, uh, we use the GISCO R package to access the GISCO uh, service, which collects shapefiles on different uh, levels. And uh, then we will define uh, here the year when it was made. This is actually quite important. So if your data is a more recent, um, then uh, you should definitely use the most recent uh, GISCO data, which is in this case 21. If you're using a bit older historical data, maybe revert back to 2016. Uh, it's a bit of a hit and miss with the Eurostat data sometimes when you want to map it. Second resolution argument is how detailed uh, this shapefile is going to be. Uh, and uh, here we opt for three, which is somewhere in the middle. The one with the most uh, detailed option is one. It just depends how you want your map to look like. And then finally, NUTS level is two. In the final step, we also transform then uh, this whole data set into this uh, WGS uh, projection. And then we plot. This is the NUTS2 map of Europe. And you can immediately notice some strange patterns. For example, some may argue that Turkey is not a European country, but still it is featured here, while other countries that are definitely European, such as, for example, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Moldova or Belarus, are not featured here. Now, the reason for that is that Eurostat has agreement with European Union members, European uh, Economic Area members, or EU candidate countries. Turkey is the EU candidate country, so it's featured here, while, for example, Moldova, Belarus or Ukraine, they're not really. Now, for Bosnia-Herzegovina, it's a different case. The country uh, became a EU candidate country only in 2022, but this data set is from 2021, so it's not really reflected here. You can also notice that uh, the UK is available 
uh, but that doesn't mean that the statistical data is available. As I said, uh, probably up to 2020, uh, there is still some available data points, but after that, that's not the case. So if we inspect this NUTS2 shapefile that we just loaded, we will see it's simply uh, an SF object with uh, the coordinate reference system that we assign to it. And then it has a bunch of columns here. For us, the most important ones uh, are uh, those denoting uh, this code here. So this one denotes the NUTS2 code that will be used. We will use this to uh, merge together with the data. And of course, it has the multi-polygon one, which denotes uh, the polygonal structure of this shapefile. Now, NUTS2 map is not terribly intuitive, especially if you never worked on this regional level. So we will overlay this map with a national boundary map. And to get the country level, we will again use the Gisco R package, but this time a different function, which is called Gisco get countries. Again, we will take the most uh, the la latest available year, uh, the resolution three in order to uh, match with the NUTS two level. And uh, because we also want to include Turkey and Cyprus, which are treated as Asian countries uh, by Gisco, uh, we will uh, provide both Europe and Asia in the list of regions we need. Finally, we uh, transform this into the WGS84 coordinate reference system. And then we explore uh, this object. We want to see what, what are the names here. Again, there are a bunch of columns, but for us, the most important one is the country ID. That's the ISO2 code, which we will use to uh, filter out some countries. Because Eurostat doesn't include all European countries, we need to create filters for our maps. And we will create two filters. One that will be called EU list, basically taking those uh, countries that exist in the Eurostat database, and non-EU list for those countries that are excluded. So just to uh, make your life easier, I uh, put here a list of countries that are not included in this data set, and I also included their ISO2 codes, which we will use to filter them out. So for the non-EU list, we simply take these countries and just put them into a list as strings. And then for the EU countries uh, or countries that are in the Eurostat list, we simply take the unique country code from our NUTS2 object. In the second step, we simply filter the shapefile based on those two lists and we create two objects. One is the EU, where the Eurostat data is available, and the other one is non-EU, where it is not. So the first is the non-EU object. Here we can see that we filtered out Bosnia, Herzegovina, Belarus, uh, Moldova, Ukraine, Russia, and Georgia. And in the second step, we map uh, those countries that are included in one way or another. You probably notice that the UK is also here. Uh, this is not going to affect the final map because anyways, we won't have the data for the UK. So it will be grayed out. In this section, I want to show you how you can easily get any available data set and load it directly into R. One of the ways to do that is, of course, if you go directly to the Eurostat database website and then fetch the code for the table you need. The other way is to use the Eurostat package in R and then call the table of all the indicators that exist in the Eurostat database. Now, that table has a title column which is corresponding to the title of the table on the Eurostat database website. So what you can do, you can define part of it, a certain string with a keyword, and then loop through that table and search for it. For example, in our case, we're interested in GDP. So we will define GDP as a string, and then what we will do, we will subset this table and search for all the titles that have GDP in the name. Here you will see a bunch of indicators that have GDP in their title. So this makes our life a bit more difficult, especially if we don't know either the title of this table or the code that we need. In our case, we do, and we find it on the fifth row exactly what we need. And we also check the code and exactly it matches what, what we need, what we saw on the Eurostat website. So in the next step, we uh, copy this one, unless we actually went to the Eurostat website and copy from there. So we copy it here. 
But if you really want to explore this data set, uh, different indicators available uh, when using, for example, this keyword or some other, you can also do that in this table. As we collected all the information about the table, we can get down to business. To load the table into R, we can use the Eurostat package and its get Eurostat function. Uh, we need to provide the table code to this function and uh, we get the table code either through the Eurostat website or by querying the table of contents. Then we also provide the time format of the year to be numeric. That's all. Then uh, we do need to provide several filters that are specific to our indicator. So if you remember when we went to the uh, Eurostat website, there was one which is unit. Unit uh, here denotes what you actually need, what specific sub indicator you need. So for us, it was the uh, GDP per capita purchasing power uh, standard. So uh, this was the name that we fetched from there. And then the next one is time. So we want to include 2020 and 2021 because there might be some uh, regions that don't have any values for 2021. We will replace them with 2020. And finally, we take uh, three columns here. One is geo, which denotes not uh, level. The second one is time, which denotes year. And finally, values. So these are uh, the GDP per capita values. And finally, we renamed the geo column into NUTS ID simply because also our NUTS2 shapefile uh, has this column, so it's going to be easier to join on it. As it currently stands, our table is in the long format. That means that for every NUTS region, we have an associated row for either 2020 or 2021 values. So for those NUTS regions that have values for both 2020 and 2021, these are duplicates. But we also have NUTS regions that have only available values for 2020 and not for 2021. What we want to do is we want to, first of all, get rid of the duplicates, but we also want to populate information for NUTS regions that have values only for 2020 with the latest available data points. So in order to do that, we first need to transform this table from a long into a wide format. In other words, we want to pivot the table in such a way that the time column is split into two columns, one with 2020 values and the other one with a 2021 values. We create this pivoted table using a pivot wider option from tidier package. And we do that by saying that uh, names from means that the time column is the one that to be split and values from is that we will take uh, the values from the values column. As we inspect the first few rows of the newly pivoted table, we immediately notice both of those patterns that I was telling you about. The first one is that some regions don't have value for 2021, but they have for 2020. And the second pattern are duplicates, where a region has info for both 2020 and 2021. In the next step, we want to get rid of these duplicates, but also we want to populate the missing values with the latest available data from 2020. In this step, we remove the duplicate values and we also fill uh, NA values with the latest available data points. And we do that by creating a new field values, which is going to take uh, the last available value from 2021. But if that one is not available, then it takes from 2020. And then finally, we select only the Knights ID in the values column. And in the final step, we uh, join this on uh, the shapefile itself in order to create a shapefile with uh, the values for each NUTS region. Now, for those of you who are familiar with SQL, we do a left join here, meaning that we will take everything from the shapefile and all other information from this enriched data frame that overlaps with the shapefile. We inspect the new shapefile and what we immediately notice is that there are some fields from the existing uh, shapefile which denotes the country or uh, the NUTS uh, level. 
but we also now notice a new field values which denotes the GDP per capita for every NUTS region. One of the often overlooked things when creating maps is defining legend breaks. I think it's a very important step because it determines the way your data points will be visualized. So in this tutorial, we'll pay special attention to that topic and we will create discrete alleged breaks. If you allow R to create uh, breaks for you, it will do that on a continuous scale, but you won't really know the method it used. Uh, in this tutorial, I will show you exactly how you can create discrete scales with from two values for each of the categories and the method that we employed. But before we do that, we first need to transform our values column because the GDP per capita is in a very long integer format. So we want to create thousands for values. So we define uh, the values column in a new way. We divide it by 1000. And once we've done that, we want to create specific class intervals. And for that, we will use the class int package and in specific the class intervals function. So for this function, we need to provide our values column. Then we need to define the number of breaks we want to create. And finally, we define the method that we will use to create these intervals. So in our case, we use the values column from our data frame. The second thing is we define six breakpoints. I usually tend to stick to six to eight because then it's uh, more visible on the map itself and the legend is also more uh, visible. And finally, for the style, I uh, choose the Jenks natural intervals. This is a very convenient method because it creates a balanced legend scale by minimizing the variance within uh, classes while um, maximizing the variance uh, between classes. Now that we have uh, these different class intervals, what we do next, we need to create a labels with from two values for each of the member of these class intervals. The way we do that, we create a labels list and then we loop through these uh, natural intervals. And then for every member of this list, a from two is created. And for the last one, which is basically the maximum value, we do not want to have maximum to maximum. So we omit this last element of the list. Our labels are here, but we now need to associate them with the values in the data frame. The way we do that is we create a new categorical variable cat and then we cut our values using the uh, breaks and label them using the labels. You probably recall that we also have some missing values in our table. So we should also account for that. Having then the missing values or a no data label in both our legend, but also that associated value in the map itself. In order to do that, we first collect all the levels for the newly made uh, cat uh, column. And then we add a new level to it, which we will call no data. Then again, we transform this column into a factor. And finally, for all those cat values that are missing, we uh, assign a no data value to them. And once we inspect the levels of our cat column, you can clearly see that apart from the existing six values, now we added another level, which is no data, which comes after the last value in cuts column. When creating European maps, I really like to limit the view of the map on the European continent itself. That means omitting a Dutch and French overseas territories or some of the Spanish islands to the dismay of my audience. But I do believe that this approach offers a better view of the European continent, a larger map from which you can clearly see the trends. Now, if you want to understand better uh, what is a bounding box, how to create it, and uh, how actually to do that in R, please check the link below on that. In our specific case, we will create a bounding box with more or less arbitrary measures, as I said. And uh, to do that, we define the minimum and maximum uh, longitudinal and latitudinal values. 
And based on those values, we provide um, this input to R and we create a polygon, which is um, gonna be our bounding box. Now in this tutorial, we'll be using the Lambert projection, which is a standard projection for uh, Maps Europe. So in the end, we will transform this polygon into a Lambert projection. And then we create the, the bounding box uh, using the SF function. Before we move on to the mapping part, I want to show you how I selected my color palette and I use a Chroma.js uh, online package to do that. Uh, this package is very convenient because uh, by providing hex code colors to it, it can determine whether your color palette is colorblind friendly as well. So we provided uh, these four uh, uh, values that we want to use in our map. And then uh, we can also choose the number of colors here. But the most important thing is that uh, the, the program finds that this palette is colorblind uh, safe. Now we have only six values, uh, so we can also choose just six values. And then down here, you can actually copy these uh, six values. In our case though, we also have uh, NA values and we wanna use a different color to um, show these missing uh, values in our legend. Uh, in order to do that, we will use a gray color uh, for that. But we also need to make sure that by adding gray color to this scheme, that it's still colorblind safe. The way you can do that is you can go to the diverging field and here you can just enter a random gray scale. And what we see here that despite adding this gray scale to this uh, palette, it is still colorblind safe. So we're also safe to proceed with creating our map. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to create our map of GDP per capita in Europe. And before we jump straight into the ggplot2 code, we will first define the colors in a specific order. As you can see, I created uh, uh, the color palette with uh, first light values and going all the way to darker values. That means if you want to specify the legend to be in such an order that you first go with the lowest to the highest value, you should also do that with the colors. And for the missing values, we'll be using uh, the gray um, color value. You can uh, place it at the beginning of your legend or at the end. In this case, I chose to put at the end of our legend. Back in ggplot2, we first map the regions and the national boundaries in a specific order. If you remember from the beginning of the tutorial, we have some countries without values in the Eurostat database and then some countries that have a value in the Eurostat database. So um, if you remember at the beginning, we created two shape files, one labeled EU for those countries that exist and non-EU for those that don't. So uh, we need to um, map these um, units in a specific order. On top of that, we have a peculiar case of a Kosovo in this um, uh, database because for NUTS2 uh, levels, Kosovo exists as a unit. But then when we move to the country shape file, uh, it exists within Serbia. So in order to deal with this issue, what we essentially need to do is we need to create a separate uh, gray layer as if the data for Serbia doesn't exist. And we need to put it on top of our um, line here in ggplot2. Now, the reason why we do that is that if we left uh, things to be like they are, then in the place of Kosovo, there would be just like a white white uh, gap and we would not be able to color that gap. This way, what we do is we simply take the country shape file of Serbia itself. We um, color it into gray and later on we add additional information on the NUTS2 level for uh, Serbia, but without Kosovo. Next, we add our actual shape file and for the filling of the polygons, we use the cat value. Now, uh, this will color the polygons itself, but we don't want, in this case, regions to have their borders. So we set the color to NA. The reason why I do that is that, as you saw, the NUTS2 map is pretty complex and I don't want some extra lines here. What we are going to do is we will add the, the national boundaries as, as special lines. So here we simply suppress the color of 
the nuts to lines and we also suppress the lines by putting that the size of line it's going to be equal to null so now we have the nuts to mapped but we also want to add the country boundaries here and this is what we're going to do in the next two lines so we will specify both eu and non-eu objects we will add the color of uh, this national boundaries to be uh, something closer to black i do prefer to keep this one white but in our case the colors of polygons are pretty bright so a good contrast would be national uh, boundary lines that are a bit darker uh, here also i will specify a certain size uh, so the size varies from uh, null to one and as it goes from null to one it becomes thicker and thicker we don't want it to be too thick but we also don't want it to be too thin so we we choose in this case uh, 0.125 but you can definitely play with this one and then the last one but not least is filling uh, the polygons uh, for this specific objects so in the case of the countries that have the values in the Eurostat database we want those polygons to be transparent uh, because they will be filled with specific nuts to values but for the non-EU objects where we don't have your set values we need to assign a missing value and this is what we actually do we assign the color for the missing value so we put nuts to polygons in place as well as the national boundaries the next step is to define the bounding box of our plots Luckily, we created this object before, so we just now need to provide the values using the chord SF function from the SF package. We have nuts to polygons in place, as well as the national boundaries. The next thing is that we limit the view of our plot to Europe proper using the bounding box that we previously created. And we do that by providing this uh, object to the chord SF function, which will then use the minimum and maximum longitude and latitude and values to limit the view we will fill the polygons using the categorical or the factor of value that we provided at the beginning so uh, because of that we need to use the scale fill manual and within this function what we do is we simply say that uh, the values of our manual uh, legend will be calls and we also give it the name that will appear in the plot, the name of the legend, which in this case is thousands of euros. In the guides, we specify the way this legend will be plotted on our map. We say that the legend should be horizontal, that its uh, key width should be a very thin, so around 1.5 millimeters, but it should be quite long, so 50 millimeters. Here you can play with the different options and maybe you want to have a vertical, let's say, legend, which is with different uh, dimensions. Then we also have uh, a title position and we chose the top title position. We want it to be middle aligned as well as those labels that we're going to create. And then we say that the number of rows for the legend will be one. That's because we are simply creating a horizontal legend. So we just need one row and the label position will be bottom if you want to show some additional information in your map such as for example title subtitle or a caption then labs function from ggplot2 is your friend in our case we want to define a title of our plot and we also want to place two captions one which will go immediately under the caption and will describe a bit more the data that we are using stating that uh, most of the data is from 2021 except for a few which are from 2020 and the next caption which goes under the x-axis uh, will simply state the name of the creator and also the data source as a final step we also customize the background of our plot what I really like to do is to create a minimal theme and then to add some additional options to it. In this specific case, we need to also define uh, the fonts, color and size for our title and captions. So for the caption that goes under the X axis, we just use axis title X and then put a different size and, and color as well as the horizontal justification and vertical justification. Uh, here you can play with the size and color as well as uh, these different positions. One thing to remember though is if you uh, choose the uh, H just of 0.5, that means it's uh, middle aligned. If you choose one that it's uh, null, then it's at the beginning and one it's uh, at, uh, at the right end. 
for the VJust option, uh, you want to have it between, let's say, 0 and 10, because this is the lower portion of your uh, graph. Uh, as you increase it, it goes upper and upper. That also applies to other options, such as, for example, title or subtitle. Now, for the legend position, uh, there are two values that you provide. One is the X value and the other one is the Y value. So one is the width, the other one is the height. And uh, they both range from null to one. So in our case, we have some kind of a middle range X value and we have a very, very high uh, Y value. So that means that our legend will be placed in the upper left corner. Of course, uh, you can change this uh, play a bit uh, with these different positions of your legend. After that, we also define the text size and color for our legend text and the title. And then we also define this legend spacing, which is a very convenient uh, function to decrease the space between your legend plot and the actual labels. Uh, and then at the very end, we also uh, define the uh, title uh, and as well as the caption uh, options. I like to uh, make title quite bigger and also to put it into a bold font and to choose the color for the title among the existing uh, color palette that I'm using. Here, as you see, it's um, middle justified. And uh, for the caption, uh, I use the same color that I used for the uh, X uh, axis uh, fonts with uh, pretty similar text size, but slightly uh, below it. And plot margin function is very useful if you want to crop uh, the additional uh, space around your map and to basically enlarge your map. So what I like to do, I like to crop uh, the plot from the right and the left and also a bit from the bottom, but giving more space at the top so that there is uh, space for a bigger title. And our map is ready. As you can see, we present all the values using our color palette including those with missing values. Now, you can also play further with this. You can choose a different color palette, or you can also change the color of the national boundaries, maybe also add regional lines as well. You can also change the color and the size of the font, including the position also and the size of the legend, but also uh, the position and the size of the caption. And that's all for today, folks. In today's tutorial, you learned how to create a GDP per capita map of Europe using Eurostat data. You also got familiar with uh, the location and the shape of the Eurostat tables, as well as how to access them in R. You also learned about the different issues that exist in the relation between the Eurostat data and the NGISCO shapefiles and how to overcome these issues in a specific context. I really hope that this tutorial will give you the wings not only to recreate this map but also to create your own maps based on the available Eurostat tables. To do that, please check the uh, link to the repo below and feel free to clone it, reuse it, modify it as you see fit. I would be happy to hear from you how this map uh, can be improved. So to do that, please reach out to me here on YouTube, on my Instagram, Twitter or Facebook. And see you next time.